Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I feel like starting a new reading vlog today so that is what we're gonna do. A couple of years ago I did a challenge and you seemed to enjoy it and I thought it was time to have a go at this challenge again which is where I attempt to read an entire shelf on my bookcase. I think I did it over the course of a month last time, I think it'll probably be a bit less this time. We'll see how we get on. I say it's a challenge. I am gonna try and read as many books as I can, but I'm not gonna get too stressed about it because we're all trying to have fun here. I have got you to pick which shelf I'm gonna be reading. I don't know yet which shelf it is. I asked you to vote on Instagram. I do have the results on my phone, but I haven't checked them yet. I put up a cutaway showing the first four shelves on my bookcase because polls and scram allow four options so that seems sensible um so before i show the winner i will show you those shelves now so that you can have a look and see what everyone had to choose from i will say i will be reading only books that i haven't read from these shelves because there's a mixture of read and unread i will also disclaimer say that i arrange my books roughly in alphabetical order. They start out being in pristine alphabetical order by author surname, but then just over time, I care less <laughs> and I slot books in where there's space and then occasionally we'll have a bit of a tidy up. So um, yeah, these are not in perfect alphabetical order by any means at all and I'm sorry if that annoys you. So let me show you the shelves that people were choosing from. There's four of them, as I said, that we can check the winners and then I'll get all of the books down from that particular shelf, show you which, which ones I've already read and we can put those to one side and then we'll have a TBR leftover of books that I'm going to be reading or attempting to read in the next few weeks. So here is that cutaway. over 1,100 people voted and there was a clear winner with 39% of the votes and that was shelf number one. So let me grab all of the books from that shelf and bring them over here. Good way to make my office a bit of a mess. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, so let's go through these books. What I'm gonna do is any book I have read, I'm gonna talk to you very briefly about it. Any book I haven't read, I'm gonna put on a separate pile and we'll talk about those. Not at the end of this video, at the end of this segment, because after this segment, we're gonna go into the portion of the reading vlog where I'm you know, actually reading the books and talking to you. So first off, we have A Spell of Good Things by Ayabami Adebayo. This is her second book. And we also have her first one, which is Stay With Me. I have read both of these books. This one came out earlier this year. This one, I think in about 2017. I love her writing. I would especially recommend Stay With Me. I read it when it was shortlisted for the Women's Prize a few years ago, and it had so many twists and turns in it. It was brilliant. It's about a woman who 
is in a seemingly very happy marriage with a man, but they have been unable so far to have a child. So his family insists that he takes on a second wife who can, in air quotes, fulfill that role. It's very rage inducing. Um, also very rage inducing is Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, which I read, I think, last year and I couldn't believe it took me so long to get around to reading her work. This was first published in the 70s and it's about a black woman called Dana who somehow accidentally time travels back to the 1800s in the States when slavery was still legal and she finds that her life is inextricably linked to the life of this young white boy who lived at that time. It is an absolutely terrifying book. Then we have Ghosted by Jen Ashworth, which I have also already read. In fact, um, most of these first few ones I have read. This was one of my favorite books a few years ago. It's about a woman who's living in a flat and her husband has disappeared, but she doesn't report him missing because she feels a bit embarrassed that he's he's gone. She thinks that he's left her. And then a few weeks later when he doesn't return and she realizes that his wallet and his phone has been left at home, she thinks, okay, I should probably you know, tell the police and his family maybe. Um, but she's got herself in a bit of a mess because whenever family members have been calling, she said, oh, he's in the shower. He can't come to the phone because of aforementioned embarrassment. So she therefore seems like quite a suspicious person. This is really a book about grief and um, I found it very, very affecting. The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett was again a book I read a couple of years ago. This is a modern retake on the book Passing by Nella Larson. I actually prefer Passing, though I still really, really enjoyed this. This is a generational story about siblings and these families are originally from this small town in America it's a very loud magpie outside. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, yeah. This family is originally from a small town in the States where there's a large population of lighter skinned black people. And some of the members of this family have moved away and have decided to try and pass as white. And it's about the consequences of this. So this is a novel about colorism, which is also what passing is about. Then we have Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam. This is a very creepy book that I think about often. There is a film of this coming out later this year with Michelle Ali, which I am very, I was gonna say excited about, excited slash terrified about. This is a book about a white family who decide that they're gonna go on holiday out of New York and they rented this cottage in the countryside and they get there and they're buying lots of expensive food and they're living their very privileged life and then suddenly all of the electricity cuts out and they don't know what is going on. It seems to be as far as the eye can see, they can't see any lights outside at all. All the communications are down as well, their phone lines are down. And then in the middle of the night, a black couple knock on the door and say, hi, this is our house, you're renting this house out from us, can we come in? But this white couple are very suspicious and they're like, I don't know if I wanna let you in my house. And there's lots of, I was gonna say undercurrents, overcurrents of racism going on there. And eventually they let them in this house and they have to figure out what is going on in the world. It is um, a book that doesn't have a whole load of answers, which makes it all the more uncomfortable. Um, and I would say that if you like Jordan Peele, you're probably gonna enjoy this book. It's great. Then we have uh, The Robber Bride by Margaret Atwood, but I haven't read this one, so I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And next up we have more Atwoods, all of which I've read. We've got The Handmaid's Tale, I don't think I need to say what The Handmaid's Tale is about, do I? No, I don't think I do. So I've read The Handmaid's Tale, uh, Oryx and Crake. Um, I have read most of Atwood's books and these are just the ones that I decided to keep. I didn't read the rest of the Mad Adam trilogy in the end. This is the first one in that trilogy. My husband read all of them and uh, quite liked them, but I just never had the urge to pick up the others and I, I don't, I'm not sure why. Anyway, I kept Oryx and Crake because it was uh, a dystopian of Atwood's that I really, really liked. The Edible Woman is one that I read so long ago. I read this when I was at university, so we're talking over 15 years ago. <laughs> um, and I don't quite remember what this is about. I think it's about a woman who becomes obsessed with what she's eating once she agrees to get married. Yes, and obviously that's a, a metaphor for everything else that's going on. That is how my mind remembers it. Hopefully that is accurate. Then we have a book that I haven't read yet, so it's going on the other pile. This is The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson. This one I also haven't read, this is The Lessons by Naomi Alderman, but I have read this, which is Disobedience by Naomi Alderman, and this I loved. I didn't enjoy her book, The Power. It was a bit too plot heavy for me, but this one 
I adored. It's about two women who used to be in a relationship when they were in their teens and then they grew apart. One of them moved to the States. They're both from this Orthodox Jewish community in North London and the woman who went to America moves back once the other woman's father who was a rabbi has died. It's about these women coming back together in their adult lives and them tiptoeing around the fact that they still kind of fancy the pants off each other. I love this book a lot, much more than the film, which is very clearly directed by a man. Also, if memory serves, they changed the ending of the book in the film and it really, really annoyed me. Next we have Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au, which was one of my favourite books of the last year. It is under 100 pages, perfectly formed, about a daughter and a mother who decide to go on holiday together. They meet on neutral grounds, they go on holiday to Tokyo and it is about a few days that they spend there and how they're awkwardly trying to communicate with each other both really want to have a good time, but also they say things that trigger each other quite a lot. Um, they know how to press each other's buttons and they um, are biting their tongue. It's also a little bit about role reversal and how the daughter feels like she's now the mother of the mother and that very much annoys the mother. I thought it was great. So I've read that, um, also have read Peter Pan. Um, I have read this several times. I've got both the novel version and the play. Uh, and I made a video years ago doing a deep dive into Peter Pan and why it is, excuse my phone, not like uh, Disney would have you believe. And I will link that video in the description box down below if you missed that all of eight years ago, whenever that went live. Then we have Boulder by Eva Baltasar, which is a book I read this year when it was long listed for the International Booker Prize. It's about a woman who falls in love with another woman and it's about whether or not they're gonna have children and how they both want different things in their future. I thought it was amazing and therefore I bought the first one in what I think is like a loose trilogy, but I don't think any of the same characters appear. I think it's just thematically linked, so they're very separate. This is Permafrost by Eva Baltasar, and it's translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez, but I haven't read this one yet, so that'll go on the not yet read pile, and we'll talk about it later. This is The Secret of Haven Point by Lizette Orton, which I read also last year? Yes, last year. This is about a group of disabled kids who live in a lighthouse in the northeast of England, and it was just an absolute joy. It's a middle grade book, own voices, made my heart happy. So I've read that one, but I haven't read this, which is her follow-up. They're not um, part of a series or anything. This is another standalone. This is the Stickleback Catchers. So this going on the unread pile. Then we have Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield, which I have read. I read it last year. I found it deeply unsettling. It's about two women who are married and one of them goes on this expedition to the bottom of the sea and they think that her, her submarine has been lost, but then they find everybody and, or at least maybe only part of the crew and they're not the same as when they went down there. They seem to need to live in water all the time. Their memories aren't what they used to be. They uh, don't communicate in the same way. And it really is a book about grief, to be honest, and loss. We have No One Is Here Except All Of Us by Ramona Ossabel, which is a book I've mentioned several times on this channel in TBRs and I still haven't read it. So again, that's going on the not yet read pile. We'll talk about it in a minute. Astral Travel by Elizabeth Baines is another book I haven't yet read yet, as is Longbourn by Joe Baker and October, October by Katja Balin. A book I have read is in the house upon the dirt between the lake and the woods, I always get the title wrong, by Matt Bell, which is a book that I loved atmospherically. I thought maybe the plot was a little bit messy towards the end, maybe a tad directionless, but the prose was immaculate, chef's kiss, one of my favorite things, so I kept it. It's about a couple who move to a house upon the dirt between the lake and the woods, and they, well, they build this house, and then they're trying to have a family, and it's not working out for them, and it's about how they cope with that loss. The wife starts building all of these rooms underneath the house, which house different elements of her grief. So one room will have bees in it, which are silent, and then another room will have just the sound of bees, but no bees. It is eerie and haunting and wonderful. So I've read that one. Then we have this, uh, it's a proof. That's what the finished cover will look like. It's out on the 11th of July, so probably out by the time you're seeing this video. This is Before We Were Innocent by Ella Berman. Haven't read this one yet. 
And then we're near the end, we've got The Old Woman with the Knife by Gu Byung Mo, which is translated from the Korean by Chi Young Kim. I read this earlier in the year. It's about a woman in her 60s who was a hit woman and she would quite like to retire, but killing people and this industry is her entire existence and she doesn't know how to break free from it. It's a brilliant character study and I would say it's like Killing Eve meets the TV show Beef meets Lullaby by Leila Samani. I thought it was very good. And then the last book is one that I also have not read since we had to remove this post by Anna Beffert, which is translated from the Dutch by Emma Rolt. I think, yes, Emma Rolt. So how many books have I not read? There are 11 of them. I don't think that I will get to all 11 in this video and in fact there's at least one that I want to save for a separate video anyway and that's this one which is The Lessons by Naomi Alderman. I'm going to be recording a vlog at some point this year where I give authors a second chance so basically revisiting authors whose work I maybe have had a hit and miss relationship with before which is exactly what I've had with Naomi Alderman. I loved one of her books and really did not like one of them so I'm going to keep this one for that video and not read it in this one. Then we have The Robber Bride. Now this is one of the only Atwoods that I haven't read. This is a very cool old edition that I found when I worked at an antiquarian bookshop and I'm pretty sure it's signed by Margaret, yes, um, when I was at the Edinburgh Book Festival. Um, she signed this one and I actually can't remember what this one is about. This is about a woman called Xenia and there are three people who knew her in the 60s, Roz, Charisse and Tony. Each of them has been badly damaged by her once. She has ensnared their sympathy, betrayed their trust, made off with their men, exploited their own weaknesses to do so. And then they think that Xenia has died, but then she walks in one day when they're all having lunch and is like, hi, are you surprised to see me? So that one actually does sound um, pretty good. So I'm hoping to get to that one in this video. The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson is a book that's giving me Clara and the Sun vibes because it is about an AI called Sylvie. Uh, it says, in a society divided between those who are born and those who are created, fully sentient robots exist to cater to humans every whim. Sylvie is designed to her husband's specifications and excels at pleasing him until she returns from hospital with her memory missing. Yes. This is the Stickleback Catches by Lizette Orton, which is about a character whose grandmother, I think, has Alzheimer's. Yes. And it's about a group of friends who come together to support each other during this time. I think it has a magical element. It also has disability rep in it. It's a middle grade book. No One Is Here Except All Of Us by Ramona Osabel. I need to either read it in this video or I need to part ways with it because it has been sitting on my shelf now for um, a very, very long time. I wanna say about eight years. And I don't mind books sitting on my shelf for a long time if I'm going to read them, but I must have started this book about three or four times and that's kind of telling. I think the reason that I haven't passed it on to somebody else is because I loved Ramona Osabel's short story collection, A Guide to Being Born, so much. So I felt adamant that I must love this book and every time I've tried to read it before must have just been the wrong time. Maybe that's true, but I will find out in this video and actually read it. It's about a small remote village, I think in Romania. Yeah, and they um, are experiencing the second world war but also are not they know that it is happening but they are completely isolated and no one knows that they are there so they're hoping to avoid conflict um so that is that one then we have permafrost by eva baltasar as i said this is translated from the catalan by julia sanchez i love the beginning of this blurb it says that Permafrost's no bullshit lesbian narrator is an uninhibited lover and a wickedly funny observer of modern life. Desperate to get out of Barcelona, she goes to Brussels, then travels to be an au pair in Scotland where she develops a hatred of the color green. I love it. Then we have Astral Travel by Elizabeth Baines, which I think is about a woman who starts to look into her father's life after he dies and then doesn't really like what she finds. Yeah, so it's about why memories may be inconsistent with other people who also experience the same event and then comparing that with facts that you can locate within someone's belongings. Then we have October, October by Katja Balin. This I think will be bottom of the TBR pile because this really is an autumnal book and I would like to read it in the autumn if possible. And I have plenty of other books to choose from. Then we have a long 
Stillborn by Joe Baker. This is a book that I bought after reading and absolutely adoring the other Bennett sister. That I listened to on audio and it is an extension of Pride and Prejudice. So I think about a third of it takes place during Pride and Prejudice but we're following it from the point of view of Mary and then the rest of the book is after the end of Pride and Prejudice and what happened to all of the characters. This one I think is happening at the same time as Pride and Prejudice but we're not following the Bennett sisters, we're following the servants who work in their house and that sounds really fascinating to me and I think because, I mean I'm mentioning the other Bennett sister, they are not related at all except for their link to Pride and Prejudice, completely different authors and probably very different writing styles but in my head they're always going to be linked because that's how I discovered this book. Because I listened to the other Bent Sister on audio I think I'm also going to listen to this one on audio. I can't really give you a reason as to why that makes perfect sense in my head but it does so I think that that's what I'm going to do. Then we have We Had to Remove This Post by Hannah Barefoot translated from the Dutch by Emma Rolt which is about a woman who works for a company that does online content moderation so she has to decide what content should be removed and why. A very, very distressing job, very short book. Definitely will be reading that in this video. And then we have Before We Were Innocent by Ella Berman, which is about two young women who were commit uh, committed, who were convicted of committing this crime in Europe. I think they're American and it's several years later, they're in the States and a very similar crime has happened. And one of them needs an alibi from the other one. I'm very intrigued by this. I think it's going to be a leading title for um, Head of Zeus for this summer. So yes, I hope to read that one too. So really that's a TBR of 10 and I think, well actually nine if I discount this, and I think that that is doable. I'm going to see how many of them I can read over the next two, three weeks. As always with my reading vlogs, I will check back in to talk to you about the books that I'm reading and let you know my thoughts, but I'll also intersperse that with some footage of going on walks and cooking and all of that good stuff. Pull up a chair, please do join me, and I'm gonna tidy up this mess that I have now made on my office floor. I will see you in a bit. Hi, this is just a quick update to say I've started reading two books. So I've started listening to the audiobook of Longbourn and I am enjoying it. It's told mostly from the point of view of Sarah, who's one of the servants who works at Longbourn, which is um, the Bennett's home in Pride and Prejudice. And one thing I wanted to mention that really made me giggle, in Pride and Prejudice, Lizzie is always walking through muddy fields with um, her, her dress on and getting her dress muddy and we're supposed to feel, I guess, as a reader, that she's a bit of a rebel because she doesn't care about her petticoats getting muddy and she doesn't care about appearing ladylike and isn't that great. But then you're reading this book from the point of view of Sarah, who's losing her mind because she's the person who has to clean Lizzie's petticoats. And she says, you know, it's all very well and good for Lizzie to think that it's fine to walk through the mud and that she shouldn't care about it because she's not the one who has to clean them. And I thought, well, actually, good point, well made. I have also picked up in physical form The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson. I am about nearly half of the way through. I think this could be one of my favourite books of the year, which is really, really exciting. This is about an android called Sylvie who has been built as this sex robot for who she calls her husband. So her husband has a human wife, um, but Sylvie lives in the attic in their building and he goes to visit her every night. But Sylvie is more sentient than she thinks she probably should be. She feels that she has a lot of emotions that maybe she's not particularly programmed to have and that confuses her. And this is giving me Handmaid's Tale meets Clara and the Sun meets Frankenstein by Jeanette Winterson. I think that it's brilliant, all these discussions on, you know, what it means to be alive and what it means to be human. And as the title suggests, the hierarchies of existence and who gets what privileges. I'm gonna read you this paragraph. She's looking at the outside. She's not allowed to go outside. She says, while absorbing a textbook on applied physics recently, I learned that glass is what humans call an amorphous solid, something almost liquid in its structure. If I choose to focus closely enough, I can see each drop of glass suspended slowly, 
so slowly settling down into itself, running in rows, tetrising, finding and filling gaps. This is with my sight calibrated to the absolute limit of my spec and I do not do it for long, but I feel as if I can see the spaces between each individual molecule. If my finger were tiny enough, I could fit it between these gaps. I could find a way outside. The garden is just there. Mm, gives me the shivers. I, as I said, loving this one. I'll report back once I've finished it and I'll also talk to you about Longbourn once I've listened to more of that. I think that one I'll listen to over quite a while. This one I will finish quicker. I think I might make some pizza tomorrow and I think I'm gonna make a pizza that has a truffle pesto base um, and then I add mozzarella and melt that on, then add rocket, a balsamic glaze and parmesan. That's my favourite kind of pizza to make. It's almost, I guess, pizza meets garlic bread territory. It's very yummy. So I'm going to make the dough today so it can prove overnight and make the pizza tomorrow. So I will insert some footage of that here and I'll come back and talk to you soon. It's the next day and I've spent too long this morning trying to take a new passport photo. Why is it so difficult? And uploading it to the government website and finding out if it was going to be suitable or not. They have so many different factors. I was looking at my old passport photo and I really don't think that that one, you know, adheres to the guidelines. I have hair in my eyes. And I'm also smiling. I don't know how that worked. Maybe they've just tightened the rules since I last got a passport 10 years ago. Anyway, I've done that now. And it's one of those tasks that's just been being transposed over into new to-do lists for the past few weeks. And I've just been putting it off and I'm very glad that I've done it now because it's an annoying thing to do. And uh, yeah, I'm not planning on traveling anywhere soon, but it is a form of ID that I need to have. So that is done. You didn't need to know that. Hey, um, I have finished reading The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson and as suspected, I really, really enjoyed this book. This is about an AI, a robot called Sylvie, who is being created and has been sold to a man who essentially wants a sentient sex doll, but not one that has too much agency. He wants to be able to have a conversation with her, but he doesn't want her to think too much for herself. But because he wants to have conversations with her 
um, about his work, etc. He has enabled a feature in her that allows her to acquire knowledge. So sometimes she can go into something called absorb mode where she can essentially surf the web in her head and learn about everything and then um, apply that to her everyday life. So for instance, her husband, as she calls him, wants to play chess. So she has learned how to play chess except now she is the queen of playing chess and she could destroy anyone, but she knows that it would be bad manners to um, to beat him. So she always lets him win, which infuriates her a bit because she knows that he's not that good at playing. Sylvie lives in the attic of her husband's house. Her husband also has a wife who lives in the main part of the house. And then at the beginning of the book, they have a baby delivered to the house, the husband and the wife. And I really like the play on words in that because this is a world where women, at least rich women, do not carry babies themselves. No, they no longer become pregnant. Babies are just delivered to their house in a car and dropped off. Sylvie likes looking out at the window when everyone else is outside so she can try and learn more about emotions and about how they're behaving. And there's this really tense moment near the beginning where she sees the child, the baby, choking outside and she, the wife doesn't notice and she's banging on the window trying to get her attention and eventually the wife turns around and sees her child choking and goes and you know makes sure he doesn't die and then the wife looks up at Sylvie and Sylvie realizes that the wife hates her. She, the wife, feels as though Sylvie, especially in that moment, is undermining her authority. She wants her gone. Sylvie then wakes up what she thinks is a few days later she can't remember what has happened and she feels really weird and she realises that she's been to the doll hospital to have some kind of upgrade. But then in her desk drawer, she finds a diary that she'd written to herself. She calls the diary self Sylvie One because that was her previous software self. This diary is written in binary and is telling Sylvie she should run away. And that's when everything really starts to kick off and that's the very beginning of the book. I don't want to talk more about plot because a lot happens in this book and obviously you should discover that for yourself but essentially this turns into a novel about Sylvie trying to gain as much knowledge about the world outside of her four walls as possible and she encounters lots of different characters along the way. At one point Sylvie spends time in a place called The Valley which is a nod to The Valley of the Dolls, which is um, a, a novel from the 60s, I want to say. I read it quite a long time ago about uh, beauty standards and, and beauty sleep, and it becomes this discussion on feminism about how men are pitting created women and born women against each other and how the world is tearing itself apart. There's also queer elements to this, which I really, really loved. It continued to be quite a lot like Clara and the Sun in many ways. Um, in Ishiguro's novel, Clara worships the sun because that's how she gets her energy, because she's solar powered, and that's the same for Sylvie. And both of those characters, Clara and Sylvie, end up creating a folklore for themselves as a way to understand the world, which is a very innate human thing to do. I love this passage early on in the book when the husband takes Sylvie out to a party in an ice bar. The party, when we get there, is in an ice bar. I've read about them. As we walk in through its enclosed courtyard, a machine blows a flurry of polymer snow all over us. It makes my husband feel like a child again, he says. He turns his face upwards and lets specks of white land on his face, delighted. To me, the swirl of white looks like data, a flurry, a stream of pieces falling, almost infinite. I want to tell him this is what it's like when I am reading, but I resist. It's a brilliant novel about how we program ourselves and how society and other people program us to feel certain ways. It is quite violent in places, definitely content warning for sexual assault in here. Um, as I said, Clara and the Sun vibes also reminded me of The Handmaid's Tale, Black Mirror, Never Let Me Go, Valley of the Dolls. I thought it was wonderful. Highly recommend. So today I need to venture outside. Every month I write an article for Toast, which I'm sure that many of you know. Those are bookish articles. Most months I review several books and talk about them, but every season this year I have been going on a walk and reading a book at the same time and then writing an article about that walk and about the book and taking photos of the walk as I go. So today is the day that I need to do that. I won't be reading a book that I'm talking about in this vlog, so I won't talk about 
that book here, but I will take you on the walk that I'm going to go on. I am going to walk from King's Cross along Regent's Canal and then through Regent's Park. And I have a hospital appointment this afternoon and I think I've timed it right that I can go on that walk and then head to the hospital. So that is what I am gonna do today. I will insert footage of that walk here and then I will come back and talk to you about books once I have read something more. Tell you what folks the wig be wigging and the makeup be makeuping today because i do not feel great <laughs> and i do not look like this without those things on i have not been feeling my best i am now on antibiotics so i am slowly starting to feel a little bit better but this week has not been my favorite uh, it's been about 10 days since i last checked in with you and i have still been reading i just haven't felt up to chatting to you which is very rude and i'm very sorry so we're gonna have a, a, a bit of a catch up right now and then um, i'm gonna do a little bit more reading and then we'll wrap things up so since we last spoke i have been i was gonna say slightly ruthless i don't think i've been ruthless i have just been making decisions which is what i should have been doing prior to this and what's the point of this video actually so that's fine so i gave no one is here except all of us by ramona osabel a second chance actually not even a second chance a third chance a fourth chance a fifth chance i am gonna part ways with this one i just i don't know i'm not being sucked into it and the writing style is something that i used to love years and years and years ago and i still absolutely adore her short stories but i don't think that this particular book is for me then I started Astral Travel by Elizabeth Baines and I don't think that this one is for me either but I'll tell you who I would recommend this one for. I would recommend this one for fans of Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver which is another book that I really respect like with this one but um, I, 
Uh, with that book, I think I admired its scope and everything it was setting out to do, but I didn't find myself being drawn to pick it back up time and time again, and that, that's how I felt about this one too. I'd also recommend this book for fans of Claire Fuller's writing as well. Um, this is about a woman who was writing a novel about her father's life and she's trying to understand him after his death because her view on him is very different to other family members views on him and she's trying to work out how that can possibly be the case because surely he was just one man and the more that she looks into the history of his life and talks to family members she realizes that there were so many things going on that she wasn't aware of at that time I thought that it was a really beautiful exploration of not false memories because everyone's memories are, are true to their own experiences but how fickle or bias those memories can be depending on your particular relationship with a person and how uncomfortable it can be to step out of that and to see someone you love from lots of other people's perspectives so yes i admired this one but unfortunately it wasn't one that i was drawn to continue reading and finish in happier news i then read we had to remove this post by hannah barefoots which is translated by Emma Rolt, I think. Let me just double check this. I think I even said this in the introduction. I always think it's her and it is, but then I doubt myself. Yes, it is translated by Emma Rolt. This is a short book about a woman called Kaylee who decides to get a job as a content moderator where she has to look at awful things that are being posted online and decide whether or not those things should be taken down. She decides to take this job because the pay is really good, but then she realizes how much of an impact it's going to have on her mental health and the mental health of those around her who also work at this company. What I really loved about this book is how it all escalated. So other people who work in this company start to believe some of the far right posts that they're seeing on a daily basis and it starts to radicalize them. Other people who work in the building start to question authority a lot because they see other people breaking the rules all the time and they think well why shouldn't I push the boundaries a little bit? Not as much as these people posting horrific illegal things online, but why can't I, you know, take an extended lunch break or maybe make out in a place where I'm not supposed to in the workplace? And everyone just kind of starts to expand themselves a little bit and take up more space. And that becomes really claustrophobic. And you can see how that could just keep on going and snowball until something really terrible started to happen because initially that thought process is quite stimulating you know should i be following everything that everyone is telling me to do why are these rules in place in the first place who is in charge should they be in charge you know questioning authority and thinking about governance but then it goes so far that it turns into fascism we don't like that I loved the ending of this book in particular. I thought that it went to a really interesting and also satisfying place. And that's what you want, especially in a short, sharp little book like this. Um, it is gruesome, obviously, and is talking about really not very nice things. However, it's not as graphic as I feared it might be. Whilst it is discussing a lot of things, there's not gratuitous details. I would say the most in-depth discussion in here is on self-harm. So if that is a no-go error for you, then avoid this one. But otherwise I thought that it was a really, really fascinating book. And interestingly, after I read that, I then decided to go to this, which is Before We Were Innocent by Ella Berman. And you know, sometimes you just pick up a book and it has similarities with the book that you've just read but they're not related to each other at all. And also you didn't know that before going in. I had that experience with this one. So at the beginning of this, we're following Bess, who is a content moderator. She works for a specific website and she looks at messages that people are sending to each other and she decides whether or not those are offensive and whether a user should be warned or blocked or if the complaint about them should be ignored. I just thought that was such like a very niche thing to link these two books. It was worth commenting on. So this, is a book that I actually decided to DNF but I think that loads of people would really really love it so let me tell you about it. At the beginning of this we're following Bess who as I said is a content moderator. She works very remotely as in she works at home but also remotely away from people and doesn't seem to want to have 
many connections with the outside world at all. And then one day a woman called Joni turns up on her doorstep. They have a huge amount of history and she says, hey, I need an alibi. It turns out that she and Joni went to Europe when they were 18 years old with their best friend Evangeline and Evangeline died. They were blamed in the papers for her death. And um, now Joni's girlfriend has gone missing and she wants best to say that she was with her. She says that, you know, my girlfriend is just re being dramatic. I'm sure she'll come back, but I just don't want any attention on me at the moment because I have a, a book that I've written coming out and I just think that would be uh, unfortunate. But you trust me, don't you? I didn't do anything. And so Bess owes Joni and she says, okay. And obviously that's not gonna get her to a good place, is it? The premise is obviously super intriguing. It's a dual timeline, so we're spending half of the time in the present day, which is 2018 for them, and then half of the time in 2008, which was when they were in Greece, when Evangeline died. I, I think the reason that I decided not to continue with this is because I've read maybe a few too many books that are similar to this, I would say it reminded me strongly of Eliza Clark's Penance. I mean, they're not related at all. They've come out at exactly the same time. But I prefer Eliza Clark's book because it is um, looking at working class families in the northeast of England. And this is looking at very, very privileged young girls who have gone on this Europe trip on their own at 18 years old. They have so much money. I'm not saying that people like this don't exist at all. I'm just, I guess I'm saying, my more realistic thing to read about would be people in the northeast of England, which is where I'm from. And I'm not as drawn to reading about very dramatic, privileged people, or at least I didn't feel like I was drawn to that right now. But I tell you which books this reminded me of. And these are books that people absolutely love. So that's why I say I think that so many people would enjoy this. I definitely got Secret History vibes from this because Secret History opens with um, a friend in this friend group having died. You know that they're going to get murdered and you spend half of the novel working your way up to that moment of murder. This has a very similar premise and it also has that element of privilege that the um, characters in The Secret History, forgot the title there for a second, have too. There were parts of this reminded me of The Idol by Louise O'Neill. Joni's character is someone who has um, emerged as a, a guru type character. She's written a book about her time being vilify, vilified as a teenager, um, but she's a very questionable character. Definitely got the idol vibes from that. It's like if Penance by Eliza Clark had been written in the style of The Paper Palace um, by Miranda Cowley Heller, which I did enjoy, but again, had that, I think it's that distance, it's that element of distance, which I think is very deliberate in the writing style, putting these girls so far out of reach because they are so privileged and so unrelatable and then making something really terrible happen to them. It's a deliberate choice. I think it is appealing. It just didn't particularly appeal to me. So if you think that that sounds up your street, then please do pick it up. So that's the reading that I've done so far, which has not been that successful, has it? We've had three DNFs and then a book that I did really enjoy. So now I want to read a few more. I am still reading Longbourn by Joe Baker. I'm nearly finished the audiobook of this, and I would like to read a couple more books on that shelf before bringing this vlog to a close. So I will love you and leave you, and I will check back in when I have done that. Hi, it is a few days later. I hadn't realized quite how many weeks this video had been filmed over until I started editing it and then realized that a few clips ago, I'd spoken about sending off my passport to be renewed and for context, that passport has already come back to me. <laughs> so it's, it's been a little while. Let's wrap everything up because I've read three more books. Let's begin with Longbourn by Joe Baker. And this is the one I was listening to on audio. I think this came out about 10 years ago. And as I said, I became aware of it because it had a bit of a resurgence after the publication of The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. I always want to say Janice Hallett and that is a different person. I think it's 
Janice Hadlow, I think, yes. Um, anyway, so this is about Sarah, who is a servant who works at Longbourn, which is where the Bennets live. The house is run by Mrs. Hill, who is in Pride and Prejudice, and Sarah has been living there since she was a young child. Um, I, I enjoyed a lot about this, but I also had some frustrations with the pacing, and there were some parts of it I liked, and some that I thought really, really dragged. I enjoyed it most when it was actually talking about characters from Pride and Prejudice that we were familiar with. I never really cared too much about the romance that goes on in here between Sarah and another character in the book. I am not drawn to romance in general and that was actually a question that I was asked recently like why I don't like um, it's not like I, that I don't like romance books like the genre, I just don't love reading about romance just in general. Um, and I'm not sure why it is, I was having a little giggle to myself, I, I, I don't know why. Um, but it has to be something pretty special for me to really care about it, it's just not something that I enjoy reading about. I don't know what that says about me. I'm a cynical person, I love my partner very much, but I just, I don't know, I'm just not that into it anyway. I didn't love the romance in this hugely um, and when we switched perspectives from Sarah's point of view to her want to be partner's point of view I found that all a little bit dull. Something that is interesting to me is that in this book and then also in the other Bennet sister Mr Bennet is not the nicest person ever and that really hadn't been something that I had considered too much about Pride and Prejudice which I've read a few times. The most recent time I read it was during the first year of the pandemic and I read it aloud on this channel and I will link that playlist in the description box down below if you're interested but I did a, a an audiobook um, on Instagram stories, well Instagram live every day I would read a couple of chapters as a way to kind of help us all be entertained and distracted and then I uploaded them as uh, larger files to YouTube I think in like five bits or something and it was in that reread that I really thought more about Mr. Bennett's, Mr. Bennett's character I think because when I'd read it when I was younger you're following Lizzie's point of view and Lizzie loves her dad and she sees him as this great person but then when you think about it more he is quite disparaging about most of his daughters apart from Lizzie doesn't seem to like women very much um, and I thought it was interesting that both the other Bennett sister and this one picked up on that and run and ran a bit more with that idea. I also really liked how in this book the servants quite like Mr Collins. They become tired of him very quickly but when he first comes to Longbourn he is commenting on every feature that he notices and he also pays great attention to how well everything has been cleaned and thanks people and they are just amazed that he's doing that because that doesn't happen very often and then yes when he starts doing it too much they get really annoyed but it's just an interesting perspective to have that the same way that I enjoyed when they were critiquing Lizzie for not caring about having muddy clothes. One thing I did appreciate which I haven't really seen in other Pride and Prejudice retellings is a discussion about money and where money is coming from, Mr Bingley's family in particular. I think in the original text it says that his family is based in trade from the north um, but in this reiteration of the text, Bingley's money comes from trade, yes, but because his father has plantations, uh, mainly trading in sugar, and then that serves as a means for the servants to learn about slavery. Mr Bingley has a footman called Ptolemy Bingley who was born into slavery, and Mr Bingley then brought him across to the UK, and when Sarah meets him... <laughs> It's difficult, I felt as though his character was really a tool for Sarah to learn about slavery and injustices in the world and I would like for him to have been a lot more than he ended up being. There was a bit more redemption I think towards the end of the book but he did feel like a prop for a lot of this story and that felt a little bit uncomfortable. So yes, I was glad that these discussions were had in this book but I think I would have liked more from them. So there were some bits of this that I did enjoy and some bits that I wasn't so sure on. There's also a, a huge part that's set during the war and I was very, very bored by that section um, in particular. So highs and lows, and if I was gonna recommend a Pride and Prejudice retelling, I would definitely recommend The Other Bent Sister over that one. Then I read The Stickleback Catches by Lizette Orton. This is a middle grade book about a girl called Mimi and 
she's not really sure what's going on with her gran. Her gran keeps having these episodes where she becomes very confused and forgetful, doesn't know where she is. And she's worried that her gran is gonna be taken away from her. She lives with her grandparents. Her gran has noticed that Mimi doesn't really have a lot of friends, so she puts an advert in the local paper to try and find fellow young adventurers who would like to go on some expeditions with Mimi. So that's how the Stickleback Catchers are formed. They're a group of kids who really like solving mysteries. And one of these mysteries that Mimi encounters at the beginning of this book is that cracks start to appear in the walls and that crows are descending and looking ominous. And she thinks that's related to her grandma's illness. And she thinks that maybe if she can stop the cracks appearing, then she can halt what turns out to be her grandma's dementia. Lizette Orton's strengths are definitely in her creation of characters and their voices, the setting, the world building. I love that Mimi lives with her grandparents in a house that is attached to a social club. Everybody who lives in the houses in that area knows each other and helps to look after each other. We have got disability representation in here. We have got um, non-binary representation in here as well. And it, there is so much about this that feels so cozy whilst also tackling very difficult topics. Parts of this reminded me of A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. And it's illustrated by Valentina Toro, who's a disabled illustrator who I really love. And she has illustrated one of my children's books too. Um, the one, I suppose, criticism, if it's a criticism, um, that I had about this book is that sometimes in the action scenes, I found it difficult to follow because there's so much going on and it felt really hectic. But then when I thought about that some more, I thought maybe that's just because I'm a grown up and I'm obviously not the target audience for this book. That would be like eight to 13 year olds. And I think I would just be more accepting in that age group of just lots of chaotic things happening and being really excited about it. As an adult, I think I was thinking about it more and thinking, wait, how, how are all of these things happening? This is happening really quickly. I would have just thought it was really cool as a kid and had been, you know, swept up in it, suspended my disbelief and all of that. So that's probably the fault of me as a boring grown up than it is <laughs> to the writing. But that's just how I felt as an adult reading. And it was something that I thought about her previous book too. But aside from that minor, minor thing, I really, really love this book. And I really loved her first book as well. Um, and if you would like some excellent middle grade fiction with disability rep and set in the northeast of England, then there you go. And then finally, I read Permafrost by Eva Balthazar, which is translated from the Catalan by Julia Sanchez. This is the first in a loose trilogy. The second one is Boulder, which I had already read. Um, I think they all have unnamed narrators. The second um, book is narrated by someone called Boulder, but that's not her actual name. That's just the name given to her by her partner. Maybe she does have a name, but as memory serves, I don't think she does. And in here, she doesn't have a name either. The blurb says that this was about... Um, a lesbian who is fed up with her life and she starts to go off on all of these adventures trying to find meaning and one of those is that she becomes an au pair in Scotland and becomes fed up with the colour green and there was something about that line that I just found so hilarious but then when I read the, the book itself that part, the getting fed up with the colour green is such a minor, minor part of the book I would have liked it to have been longer. But this is very fragmented as Boulder is as well. It's just lots of musings on what it means to be a human and how are we alive and how do we continue to be alive when so many stressful things happen. And it's deeply funny in places as well. So she's decided that she really doesn't wanna have kids and her sister has just rung her to tell her that she's having a second baby. So she is trying to summon up some kind of enthusiasm. So this is all one sentence of her saying these things down the phone to her sister. Oh, that's great. That's really, really great. Oh my God, it's so amazing to be an ant twice over. It's like being a fully fledged ant, like going from wearing a monocle to wearing a pair of glasses or from riding a tricycle to riding a bicycle. I finally feel like I've got my life as an auntie under control. Hell, you left me hanging for so long, but suddenly here it is, this little person who's decided to charge right into the wonderful business of living. And it couldn't have hoped for a better parents. Parents with stable jobs and a gorgeous house with a bedroom just for her or for him, because of course, two months in, you don't have any way of knowing yet whether it'll be a boy or a girl, though I don't actually know why I'm talking about it in the future since it's already a boy or a girl. It already exists inside your belly. Oh, it must be amazing to be pregnant and feel life growing inside you. I'm sure this pregnancy will be as terrific as the first one and that everything will be great, just great. And it's so sweet of you to share this news with me. You've made my morning. This is the kind of news that makes a person feel like it's all worth it. And besides, when the family gets together for Christmas, there won't be 13 of us anymore, which people say is bad luck, but one more little girl or boy, and that's just terrific. 
a colossal effort that leaves me dead tired. Seriously, this is the sort of behaviour that drives people to medicate. <laughs> this character just feels as though she's walking through life as a ghost and whenever anybody becomes too attached to her, she just severs them out of her life and that's the same not just for people actually but for jobs as well if she gets too attached to a job she gets disgusted with herself and she decides to leave and then she starts thinking about her younger years when she was a teenager and started learning about sex and all of that stuff it's very very similar to Boulder maybe the protagonists in a way are a, a little bit too interchangeable but I think that it's its writing that that holds it up on a sentence based level I think that it's really good the ending of this one had a bit of shock factor twist which I didn't particularly appreciate it sometimes I feel like huge things like that at the end of books can cheapen the rest of the text and I had a little bit of a gut feeling of that but overall I still really enjoyed reading it a um very unlikable narrator in parts same as with Boulder but also um, very witty um, and you find yourself laughing along with her even in moments where you feel like maybe you shouldn't. So I am glad that I read that one. So that brings us to the end of this video. There ended up being one book that I didn't read um, that I said I would try and read in this video which was The Robber Bride by Margaret Atwood but you know what? I don't mind. This can stay on my shelf for a little bit longer. That is fine. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the only Atwood novel that I haven't, you know, attempted to read before. Um, as I said, I didn't read the second two in the Mad Adam trilogy, but apart from that, I'm pretty sure I've read every single other novel by her. So that one can stay there for longer. That is absolutely fine. And then I didn't read The Lessons because I'm going to read that in a Giving an Authors a Second Chance vlog. And I didn't read October, October because I'm going to read this in the autumn. So that means I finished and read, like read and finished, five books in this vlog and then I DNF'd three books. So I DNF'd No One Is Here Except All Of Us, Astral Travel and uh, Before We Were Innocent by Ella Berman. I'll make sure that these find good homes elsewhere. And out of the ones that I read, let me rank them quickly. I think out of these five, my least favorite was Longbourn by Joe Baker, but I did enjoy many parts of this. Then The Stickleback Catches by Lizette Orton, which I really, really did enjoy. Then Permafrost by Eva Balthazar. Second was We Had to Remove This Post by Hannah Barefoot. And my favorite was definitely The Hierarchies by Roz Anderson. As I mentioned, I think this is going to be one of my favourite books of the year. I thought this one was brilliant. I would love to know if you have read any of the books that I have spoken about in this video or if you would like to now that I have talked about them. Thank you very much for joining me. If you are new to my channel and you enjoyed this video and you would like to subscribe, that would be really lovely. And if you like my content and you have the means to and would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be lovely. There's a link to that in the description box down below. Patreon is a place where you can tip creators whose work you enjoy. You can tip from $1 or £1 a month and you can cancel at any time. There is some extra stuff over on Patreon, but primarily the support over there just allows me to keep creating free content for everybody on here and funds my time making it accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. So any support you can give over on Patreon is very, very much appreciated. But if you can't support over there sharing being here commenting liking all of that is appreciated too i'm sending lots of love to you all and i will be back for another video next week bye